I'm Kimberly Davis. I'm the author of Brave Leadership. And today on the show, we're going to talk about how you can step into your brave through purpose. Congratulations. You are tuned into Dolph Barron's Leadership and Loyalty Show, the number one podcast for Fortune 500 executives and those who are dedicated to creating a quantum leap in leadership. Your host, Dolph Barron, is the founder of FullMontyLeadership.com. He's an executive mentor to leaders like you, a contributing writer for Entrepreneur Magazine, CEO World, and he's been featured on CNN, Fox, CBS, and many other notable sites. Dov Barron is an international business speaker who was named by Inc. Magazine as one of the top 100 leadership speakers to hire. Now, over to Dov Barron. Welcome, dear friends, fans, and fellow aficionados of leadership excellence. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Dov Barron's Leadership and Loyalty Tips for Executives, part of the Full Monty interview series. I'm your host, Dov Barron. I'm the founder of Full Monty Leadership, and I'm here to assist you tapping into your deep greatness so you can reach that next level of clarity, focus, purpose, and profit in your business, in your life, and your leadership impact. Today, we're going to be taking an insider look at the need for today's leaders to be brave, why it matters, and what bravery really is. Remember, you can now chat with us about this episode or any of our past episodes on Facebook. We have a Facebook group. It's under Dove Barron's Leadership and Loyalty Podcast. If you're a new listener, new viewer, thank you for joining us. Strap yourself in. We're about to go full Monty. Remember, you can find us on iTunes, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or anywhere that you normally listen to podcasts. We always need your help in staying relevant, so please get yourself over to iTunes or Google Play, rate, review, and subscribe to the show. We do need your help, so please, get when you've done that review, get back over to the Facebook page, uh, Facebook group, Tell us you've done it. And you know what? We may be giving you a shout out on the live show. You can also find us on traditional radio stations across the United States every Monday and Thursday on uh, traditional radio stations from Las Vegas all the way to Florida. Also, you can find us on Roku TV where there's over 100,000 subscribers. And if you're a regular listener, big thank you to you for making us the number one podcast globally for Fortune 500 listeners with a potential reach of 2.5 to 4 million listeners for every single show. We're honored and grateful to be cited by Inc.com as the number one podcast to make you a better listener. Remember, you can find us on Google Play, uh, which is Google Home, and Alexa, just simply say, play Dove Baron Podcast. Again, thank you for sharing this show with everybody you know. All right, let's strip it down, dive right in. As a leader, whether you're a CEO, someone in the C-suite, sales leader, or an entrepreneur, or leader in any capacity, you know that leadership has many forms. There's that nice, often spineless and ineffective uh, version of leadership. There's the hard line, which is often effective at meeting deadlines, but awful at uh, bonding people into your organization and as a result, losing talent. However, there's another kind of leadership. It's called brave leadership, the brave leader. And on this show, we're going to find out exactly what a brave leader is and how you can cultivate that in you. Our guest today is a, was a professional actress who has turned leadership educator and author Kimberly Davis. As an expert in authentic leadership, Kimberly Davis shares her inspirational message of personal power, responsibility, and impact with organizations across the country and teaches leadership programs worldwide. Most notably, her program, On Stage Leadership, which runs in New York City and Dallas, Texas. Additionally, Kimberly teaches authentic influence and executive presence for Southern Methodist Universities at the Business edu- uh, Executive Education Program and partners with the university in teaching the Bush Institute Women's Initiative. Fellowship programs empowering female leaders in the Middle East and for the National Hispanic Corporate Council. Kimberly is a TEDx speaker and her new book is Brave Leadership. Unleash your most confident, authentic, powerful self to get the results you need, which was named as the number one book to read by Inc. Magazine's Top 12 most influential, sorry, most impactful books to read in 2018. It's got a cover endorsement by Dan Pink, and it's available in bookstores. It's available online. It's all over the place because it's super. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together and welcome Kimberly Davies. <laughs> welcome. 
<laughs> that, I tell you what, you just make me feel like a million dollars, Dove. I, I need to talk to you every day. <laughs> well, you are a million dollars, Gil, so I thank you. <laughs> Appreciate it. You know, it, it's really good to have you here. And, you know, and I want to say that uh, I, I, I'm grateful and I'm honored because I know that we have a lot of connections on LinkedIn and you're very generous in sharing my material out there. And, uh, and I, you and I were talking about before that, you know, you're not just a guest, you're a regular listener, which is pretty cool. So thank I'm you. I'm kind of addicted to your podcast. <laughs> I mean, truly, really, I, I drive because I live in Austin, Texas, and I do a lot of work in Dallas, Texas. Um, I'm driving back and forth three and a half hours. And so you keep me company. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. <laughs> well, well, <it's> <laughs> I've learned a tremendous amount. It's good to know that you're not bored with me yet. So you're like, no, I'm canceling the show. <laughs> I've had enough of Dub Baron no, Lucky a lot of time. Well, you're, you're kind of, you, we're kind of kindred spirits. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm there. You're singing to the choir, you know. All yeah, exactly. So let's, let's jump right into, you know, because I feel like in, in many ways it is my mission and I see it in your work that we are redefining leadership uh, in the way that it was, particularly when, you know, I started out. It's, it's, it's quite different. And you're in the process, you're also redefining brave. And I, I, I yeah. like that. Talk to yeah. us about yeah. redefining brave. Because I think that we think of brave as these massive acts, you know, the running into the burning fire stuff. You know, exactly. And I think we need Absolutely. To really grasp it differently. Well, Go you ahead. know, if you if you actually look at the the definition for brave in the dictionary, it's it's being willing to face and endure pain and danger. <laughs> <laughs> and okay. so I don't know about you, but I'm not, you know, really excited about, yeah, I can't wait to face and endure pain and danger today, right? Mm, and yet when you think about- like delicious. Right, yeah, woo, can't wait for that. <laughs> um, but, you know, you think about brave leadership and yet, and brave is this kind of aspirational thing. And you think, wow, you know, I, I can think of a lot of leaders out there who don't seem to have any problem facing- pain and danger. And yet at the same time, I wouldn't aspire to be like leaders, like those kind of leaders. Right. right. And so when I started to think about, you know, what kind of leader do I want to be? What is my contribution to the world? Right. And what does bravery mean to me? I knew that I needed, I needed to shift the way I was thinking about it because if I'm focused mm -hmm. on, on, on the pain and danger, Right. right. You know, if, if I want to be brave and I'm focusing on the pain and danger, that's going to stop me in my tracks. Right. You know, I'm, I'm going to like, oh, pain and danger. Don't want that. It's going to change the way I show up in the world. It's going to cause me to dial myself back. It's going to cause right. me to cause me to play a smaller game and and not bring the best me out into the world. And if what I'm really up to in the world is making an impact and being the best me that I can be. Uh, I needed to redefine what brave looked like. Oh. And so the, yeah, so the way I look at bravery is I, I think of bravery as being your best, most authentic and powerful self, because I think that is the biggest challenge that we all face. And if you can do that, right, if you can be your best self, and let me tell you what, that is not, it's, it, it, it sounds like an easy thing to do, but being your best self it insinuates that there's responsibility. Right? You're taking responsibility for your, for your actions and then the impact that you're, you have. You're constructive in your actions. You're constructive in the way you're showing up in the world. Your most, uh, your most authentic self, you know, who you truly are. I think you know, the one thing when I look at people who are willing to be who they truly are powerfully in the world, the one thing that they have in common is their courage because it is not easy to be who you truly are in this world powerfully and responsibly. So to me, that is the biggest challenge that we face. That's mm -hmm. what it means to be brave. And I knew that if I can, if I can focus my attention on that, how do, I, how do I achieve that in this situation, right? How do I achieve that in all of the different situ situations I face as a writer, as a speaker, as a leader, uh, as, a, as a mother, as a friend, right? Mm -hmm. How do I be and bring my best, most authentic and powerful self to that situation so I can have, the, have a chance to make the impact that I'm there to make, then that would set me up for success. Way more the, than focusing on the pain and danger, right? Well, that's the, that's the dichotomy of our time though, because um, we, we are, are hearing in leadership constantly, you need to be uh, more authentic, more vulnerable, et cetera. Yeah. Um, and yet, you know, and, and the, that part of the dichotomy is that social media 
uh, we live in a social media world. I'm not, yeah. I'm not shitting on social media. I like social media, but we live in a social media world. And the problem with that is that nobody's life exists on Facebook. So there's a, there's a visage, right. there's, a, there's a persona, which is not the right. truth. Right, right. And and yet we're being asked to be more vulnerable. And if we are, we're afraid yeah. the I think the potential for rejection is is greater because you can you know everybody in the world is going to see about it. And I think right. that you're absolutely right in that the real courage is to stand up. The real bravery is to say this is who I am, and not as in a stuck place, but this is who right. I am in this moment. Uh, yes, I hope I'm evolving, but this is who I am in this moment, and I'm willing to face the rejection is is the is a big piece of the bravery, wouldn't you say? Oh, oh, absolutely. And I think so much of of the authenticity, right? When you talk about authenticity and the framework of leadership and influence, uh, mm -hmm. you know, authenticity is one of those words that people are banding banding about like crazy today, and, and mm -hmm. we've lost we've lost the sense of what does that really mean. Right. You now you jump on Facebook, you know, you talk about social media, you jump on Facebook and in five minutes, you're going to see some kind of meme that says, be authentic, you know, be yourself. Who cares what anyone else thinks? And I mean, you know, uh, that from a leadership and influence perspective, that definition doesn't really cut it because you really no. do have to care about what people, how people experience you and what people think. And so, um, I, I'm pretty sure you're familiar with Bill George's work. Uh, he's, course. Bill George wrote a book for you, for your listeners. He wrote a book called, you know, authentic, authentic leader, leadership. authentic leadership. So, you know, when you write the book called authentic leadership, you get to be the guru, but he's also written a great book called true North, uh, which mm -hmm. is also about purpose. Um, but the way Bill George defines authenticity is, are you genuine, worthy of trust, reliance, and belief? And what I think is really powerful about that is that uh, you don't get to decide, right? You know, you mm, don't get to decide no, if you're genuine, no. worthy of trust, reliance, and belief, the people that you're trying to lead and influence do, right? So in your case, your listeners, your readers, your audience get to decide, you know, the people that you, in the companies where you're consulting, they get to decide, do we truly experience Dove as someone who is genuine, who is worthy of trust, who's reliable and is believable? I mean, you can decide that all day long, which is lovely, but it's not really going to help you lead or influence, right? And, and it's so, fascinating when, when, you know, I'm sure you hear this too, you know, I've had leaders who said to me, how do I become more authentic? Yeah. And I was like, wow, that is like such a powerful question because it, 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 it has such, uh, it's so wrought with, with lack of authenticity to even <laughs> say, how do I be authentic? Yes. Exactly. Right? Well, because, I, I think as people, we don't know ourselves. You know, we're so, so focused on point. trying to be what we think we should be and prove ourselves and, and fit some kind of leadership mold, right? And that mm -hmm. we don't know who we truly are as human beings. And I think that's the starting point is really getting clear on who are you? What do you care about? What matters to you from that internal place for real? Not what does your boss think should matter to you? What does your mom right. tell you? matter to you but what truly lights you up as a human being from that internal spot so then when you can get to that clarity on this is what i care about then you can start to ask yourself okay what's the impact i want to have if this is what i care about and this is what i'm doing what's the impact i want to have in the work that i'm i'm doing you know but again and that's back to the bravery um that i think is so essential for people to grasp and absolutely. what i mean by that is the bravery to you know I, i've talked about this so many times the courage to look within is the greatest courage. Absolutely. You know, I, I, I did a, I did a video on this recently where I talked about conscious versus unconscious bravery. Yeah. And I said, you know, I have a friend who I know um, was going to court to deal with his ex-wife who maybe a little on the, she might need a little <laughs> bit of help from a certain medication of kind. <laughs> <laughs> He's done some crazy shit. Um, and, you know, he is sweating yeah. in fear of, of going in that courtroom and having to deal with this person who is sociopathic in her behavior and can hold the, the, and can hold the persona. Uh, and it's fascinating because that's the same guy who I know um, got to a traffic light where there was a crash ran out of his car and pulled yeah. two people out of a burning vehicle. Yes. Yes. So, so you go, here's a guy who's really courageous, 
who's shitting himself to deal with his wife. Right. And because the one is a reactive, unconscious bravery. Right. Loving and caring. And the other one is, 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 can I own who I am in a given situation and stand up for what I believe in and what's my truth? And that journey requires inner knowledge. Absolutely. But it's also truly about his focus, right? So I think our focus Absolutely. determines our bravery. So in the situation where he goes and, and helps the person from the burning car, right? His focus is on helping the person. His focus right. is outside himself. It's not on it's not on himself at all. In the courtroom, he's focused on you know, hit the repercussions that might happen if he doesn't show up the way he wants to show up on what his wife might do to him on having to, to, to prove his case. He's focused on himself and the pain and danger, right? Absolutely. So that's the whole thing. If you're focused on the pain and danger, you can't show up as your best self. If he were to go to that, that car accident, right? And he's to focus, focus on, oh my gosh, I might burn to death. Oh my gosh, I could die doing this. He would not be able to do exactly. What what it, it was his focus of attention that allowed him to be brave. Right. And that, that's, yeah. I mean, that, that's what I think is such a good point for us all to get is, <clears throat> you know, we, we, we have to be willing to a know ourselves better right? and, right. and be willing to have the courage to look in, <clears throat> which by the way, can feel like pain and danger. It can, the, the, it the can. The potential of looking at yourself. But you also have to look at what is the, as you know, and you and I, as, as you said, we're singing, singing to the choir here, but this, the willingness to look at, okay, there's some pain and danger, but what about the impact? Right. What right. is, you know, and for me, you know, if you're going to be purpose driven, you're always driven by, well, what is the impact that I can have? Absolutely. What impact will I have if I step up and play a bigger game? And exactly. that is, to me, that is so powerful and driving in what we do to me that cuts through everything right mm -hmm. it, cu it cuts through everything because when we're focused on the pain and danger when we're focused on what people are going to think about us or trying to prove ourselves or all those very human things that we do yeah. right yes um what's going on is our amygdala in our head that you know that for your listeners that aren't aren't familiar with the amygdala it's the center for pain uh, for emotion management right so the amygdala in your head's going crazy it's sending cortisol through your body which is sending those messages to you through your sweaty palms through your heart beating through all these physiological sensations that saying you need to stop yourself or you're going to get hurt right and so what what uh, shifting your focus to impact what I call your super objective, which is essentially purpose in action, shifting your focus outside yourself, it, what it does is it gets, you, gets out of your amygdala's way. Your amygdala doesn't register the pain and danger, so it doesn't send the cortisol coursing through your body, which is a, what allows you to show up more powerfully in the world. So you mentioned it there. You 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 mentioned this thing about this super objective, and, and mm -hmm. I I want to I want to talk about that because um, I know you're a student of uh, theater. Um, yeah. I had a little uh, put my toes in those those waters a long long time ago, um, and one of the great acting teachers was Stanislavski, yeah. and, and talked about immersing yourself and and getting the backstory on your character and all of, all of right. that. How does that tie into the super objective? Because I, I, you know, when what I was reading in your book, there it really, I, I felt like it really pulled that together. Oh, th oh, thank you. Well, so it, it, it was really interesting. Stanislavski, what, you know, he was an actor, he was a director, but he was also a businessman, which it made him very unique. I mean, if you know a lot of, a lot of artists, right, you know that most artists don't, uh, don't consider themselves business people, but he, mm -hmm. uh, his family ran some of the most successful businesses in Moscow. And so he ran the Moscow Art Theater and he, he wanted to understand why were some actors really successful at drawing the audience in so they would return to the theater and they would make the theater all this money? And why were some actors really not that successful at making the theater money? Because it really was about how do we make the Moscow Art Theater a successful business, right? right. And so he started to do a lot of research around this and he was studying the actors that really drew the audience in and he was, he was studying what is it that they're doing differently. And it turned out, it had nothing to do with the things that you might think 
it might be. You know, it had nothing to do really with their experience. It didn't have anything to do with how charismatic they were or how attractive they were or any of the things that you would think would normally might think, yeah. make the difference, right? Mm -hmm. What it had to do was that these actors instinctually understood how to shift their focus off of themselves. So mm -hmm. they weren't, you know, they weren't doing the things that, you know, we do as human beings when we're in the spotlight and we are feeling nervous, right? They weren't trying to prove themselves. They weren't paying attention to the butterflies in their stomachs. They weren't trying to show how talented they were. They weren't doing any of those things that really are about trying to putting the spotlight on ourselves, right? And instead they were focused completely on achieving action to, a, to make an impact in a specific moment in time. The achieving purpose, essentially, Doug. Mm -hmm. It was, they were, they were focused on achieving purpose on a moment to moment basis, igniting a live moment in time on the stage. And it, the byproduct, what I think is so exciting is, is it's the byproduct of that that gave them presence. Mm -hmm. It was the byproduct of that that made the audience go, wow, that was flipping amazing, right? It wasn't because they're like, please like me, please like me, please cheer for me. No, 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 no. They weren't thinking about that at all. They were thinking about how do I make an impact on this character that's with me on the stage right now in this moment? How do I change that person somehow, right? And, I, and what I've come to learn, and I know is, you know, you know this to be true from all of the, the work that you've done, is that the best leaders are the leaders who are, aren't focused on trying to, you know, prove themselves to their shareholders and trying to show how powerful they are. The best leaders out there are truly focused on making an impact. They're, they're focused on something bigger than themselves. And it's the byproduct of that that makes people go, wow, you know, I want to be a part of what you're doing. Wow. You know, I would crawl over broken glass to, you know, to be a part of this, to engage, right. to listen, yeah. you know, and, but it's a byproduct. And I think, What's, what's so powerful about Stanislavski work, and you know, and this was, this was a century ago. This was long years, before yeah. Simon yeah. Sinek. This is long before right. anybody started talking about any of these things. I said he was, he, he was clear that harnessed, a harnessed focus of attention on something outside yourself, on some unpurpose, on your why, is mm -hmm. what allows us to show up more powerfully. It is, it's, it's what gives us the power to make an impact in the world. Yeah. You and I are both speakers, and uh, I, <clears throat> I have something called the Authentic Speaker Academy for Leadership, in which I yeah. train leaders to be speakers and speakers to be leaders. Yeah. The two things go hand in hand, as far as I'm concerned. A and, you know, we talk a lot about um, stage fright and nerves. Yeah. And I yeah. say, you know, I've been speaking for 34 years, and I still get very nervous. Yeah. And people go, really? I, you know, you would never <laughs> know, right? Yeah. And I'd say, no, I, I understand you would never recognize that. But I am like, I've got anxiety up the yin yang before yeah. I go on stage. And, and people will ask me, how did you get over it? And I said, um, for a long time, I tried to be a better speaker. Um, and I became very good, but that wasn't the answer. And right. they said, what was the answer? I said, it, it was something simple somebody had said to me. And, and they said, what was that? And I said, it isn't about me. Yes. It's yes. that simple. Yes. If it's about me and it's about the applause and it's about all that, then right. that's why that's the problem. That's why I'm having the anxiety because it's about me. As that's opposed right. to I show up with my commitment to serve and my anxiety is my own ego going, Oh, what if they reject me? Or yes. Shit is yes. right. Which is the fire and the danger and all the, all the <laughs> trauma. <laughs> As opposed to, what if I set them on fire? Exactly. What if I could actually set their hearts and their souls on fire and waken, awaken them? And that's my only objective. Is And I've literally, um, when I really grasped this, I literally stopped myself in a presentation. I was 15 minutes into a presentation, okay. and I said, I, I said into the mic, I'm better than this. Wow. And, and I stopped and I said, I am here to serve you. And I'd forgotten that for this first 10 minutes. Please yeah. forgive me. Let's make this about you because it is about you. Yeah. And, and people were like, yeah, 
Like, like what? Because that's, you know, because that's. Because you spoke your truth. You spoke a truth, right? I, well, I called myself out on my bullshit and just stopped right. and went, you know what? This is nonsense. It's smart. Right. And I, one of the things I teach people is, as speakers is, is choose heart over hype. Yeah. Choose heart o- over head. Yeah. And I was busy trying to look smart, which is hype. No. I was busy in my head. No. I'm here to serve. And that shift you know, is that super objective of being outside of yourself, which is just love Absolutely. about what you're saying about real courageous leadership. Because, you know, we could, we could change the title from brave leadership to courageous leadership, to servant leadership, to purpose-driven leadership. Right. To it's the leadership. same thing. It's the but same they're thing. All, it's all the same theme, but it requires us to show up fully. In a, yeah. Fully. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and I think and I think the thing that you really hit on, which I th- I find I, I love that you hit the, hit on this, is that you spoke your truth, right? And we talked about vulnerability earlier, right? And yeah. and it was the fact that you took the mask down. You said, "Hey, this is what's real," right? And I think what's uh, what's interesting nowadays is that now that vulnerability is getting to be like this really sexy thing. That's Everybody's cool. talking about be vulnerable, be vulnerable. People are manipulating vulnerability now. They're like, "Oh, see, I'm such a victim, and it's so sad." And that's not vulnerability, people. Vulnerability is saying, "Look, you know what." I'm going to look at, I'm going to look at myself and I'm going to say the hard truth. I'm going to look at the hard truth about myself. Yeah. And, people think vulnerability is weeping on stage. And, and uh, although that can happen, it can happen. Um, some performance version of that makes me insane. I mean, I, oh, I cause absolutely. I can spot it and I know, I know millennials cause they've, They've got bullshit meters a mile high. I love it. <laughs> right? But, you know, you start going on stage and you start crying for effect. You know, you People have know lost. what's not real. People Absolutely. know what's not real. Right. And, and you, you, know, you know this. I mean, I, I watch shows, TV shows, and, and I'm like, I'm in tears. And other ones, it's a very moving scene. I'm like, yeah. Yeah. And it's the difference is exactly what you're saying about Stanislavski. This, the difference is the embodiment of the character. When I watch This Is Us, I yeah. cry. Oh. Because, <laughs> because oh. it's, not, it's not only brilliantly written, but it's each so actor honest. It's so owns, the, owns the, I, I, like for me as a speaker t- a trainer, I go, I know that each one of those characters fully embodies that personality while they're playing it. And I'll That's bet right. it's difficult to go home and drop it. That's exactly and that's part right. of the deal, you know. It's yeah. and so but you know what's so interesting great. too is that you're you know you're talking about crying on stage and how that you know, people people can manipulate that way. And I and I think what's really interesting is if you look at human nature, right? And this is true for actors too. If an actor goes on stage and they cry, you know, they're they're crying. Um, usually, the audience, like you've like you mentioned, totally unaffected, right? It's like mm, mm-hmm. you're crying. Mm-mm. Because when someone is truly in pain and they're truly trying to fight it, they are trying not to cry desperately, yeah. right? Yeah. They're trying, to, they're focused on, on holding it in and reeling it in. And the, the byproduct of holding it in is that it, it escapes. But it's right. not because they're trying to be sad. Right. Right. Because that's manipulation. And so what you pick up on in this is us and what you pick up on in speakers that really move you to tears is that it's not about them. They're not trying to have an effect on you. The effect is a byproduct of truth. Right. And there you go. That's just the point I want to get people to. The effect is a byproduct of truth. Authenticity, brave leadership. is It's about impact. Uh, and so when you stand in your truth, you get to have this byproduct, which is called impact. And it's fascinating for me because I had it, and I'll tell you that I've been speaking 34 years and for at least the first 10, I had it the other way around. I thought it was about the impact. I thought it was about the impact first. And, and you know, and I've said that leadership is impact. I agree, but still say that. But it's, as you so eloquently said that, it's a byproduct of you fully being authentically showing up for, right. as who you are with the intention that's greater than you, an intention right. that is beyond you, that is your purpose, that is that I'm, I, wanna, I want to make a difference and right. I am willing to put myself out of the way. You know, right. and, and I gave this example in, in my trainings when I said to somebody, I said, if... 
if you ask me, am I a good speaker? And I answer with, I am freaking awesome. <laughs> is, that, is that humble? And they say, no. And I said, actually, it is. And they said, what do you mean? And I said, that's the exact opposite of humble. I said, no, it's not, actually. Because if you look at the Aramaic root of that word, the Aramaic root of the word humble means God first. And they go, oh. So I, so I said, so is it humble? And they go, I don't know if it is then, but maybe it is. And I said, here's the deal. If you ask me if I'm a great speaker and you're talking about me, the personality, average. But when I get out of the way, when I yeah. let divine guidance, whatever one wants to call it, you know, yeah. when I let that come through me because I'm here to serve, I'm right. spectacular. Right. And but it has nothing to do with you. Yeah, right. Nothing, but that's the point. Right. That's the point. And if I was to yeah. say, well, I'm okay, what I would actually be doing is dis dishonoring that, that guidance that flows through me. So it's, it's like, it's beyond me. And so that's the, 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 what I love right. about what you're saying here about being that leader is, is make it beyond you. Right. Right. And it's, it's, it's almost, a, it's a co-creation, right? It's a yes. co-creation with the person you're connected to, right? It's all about connection. It's, it's funny people, you know, I, you, you, in my bio, you were like, she teaches authentic influence and executive presence and la, 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 and all these different things. And, 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 you know, the HR world, we love to put things in boxes. We've got our, you know, you teach your leadership class and your influence class and your presence class and presentation skills class, but I don't look at them like they're all different things, like they're all different boxes. I look at it all, all it's all one thing. It's all about connection. We're either yes. connecting or we're not. We're because not, if you right. can't connect, you can't lead. If you can't connect, nobody's listening to you, right? If you can't connect, you can't influence. So it really truly is all about connection. And so that focus on impact outside yourself is that connection, is that co-creation with the other person that you're trying to you're trying to have an Im you're trying to impact you're trying to change you're trying to you're trying to make a difference to yeah beautifully, it's beautifully said step. beautifully said now in the book you spoke about the research of uh, dr george land yeah and jarvis and the work with nasa and yeah. the, around creativity and then taking that research and applying it to kids um and you know the yeah. the, the, the the chapter i think is called disappearing Disappearing genius, genius, yeah. disappearing genius. Yeah. Disappearing yeah. genius. Um, talk to us about that in the context of where we're going here, because I think it's, it's a very powerful tie-in. Yeah, well, so it's so interesting. What, what Land did is he, uh, he decided to, he was doing a, a, a thing for NASA, right, where he, they had asked him to develop a, um, a, a test to, to tell who, you know, they were test to, to, for new applicants who were applying to NASA. How, how do we know that they've got the right, the right stuff, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Um, anyway, and so um, this test was so interesting that he decided to give it to 1,500 uh, five-year-olds. And mm -hmm. so he gave it to 1,500 five-year-olds. Out of 1,500 five-year-olds, it turned out that 98% of them tested in the genius level for creativity, which is like, how is that possible, right? Yeah, I just want, I want to stop for a minute because I want everybody to grasp that. So here's a test on creativity designed for NASA to find out if people have got the right stuff in the context of creativity. The same test given to three to five-year-olds and 98 plus percent show genius. Isn't that amazing? Just stop for a moment and let that go in. Because you might think you're, you're a dumbass and you might think that you've got no creativity <laughs> and you might say, yeah, I'm about as creative as a stick. But you were once three to five years old. Yeah. That's, and I think that's something that's critical for every one of us to remember. Right. And so what he did, fast forward five years, you know, he gives the same test, same group of kids. Now they went from 98% creative genius to 30%. At how old? Genius. At f five years later. Right. Wow. So they're eight to 10. Only yes. five year difference. Right. So wow. then you fast forward another five years and it went from 30% to 12%. Oh my God. Right. So you watch what's happening as these kids yeah. get older. And what, what's really interesting though, Dove, and for your listeners, I, mean, I would presume that most of us are over, over, you know, 20 years old. Maybe there's some geniuses out there who are listening that are much younger, but uh, he tested a group of adults 
uh, I think it was something, I don't remember how many adults it was. It was like 10,000 adults, a massive group of adults. And mm. only, so um, how many, how many, you, know, you read the book, but do you remember how many adults tested at the genius level of creativity? Wasn't it, wasn't it 2%? 2%. Right. 2%. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I started thinking about, I, I, I saw Lance Ted talk and uh, I, then I dug into a bunch of his work and, and I started thinking about, well, how does that, how, how does that, how does that connect to everything else I know? And I started thinking about, well, what is creativity really? You know, creativity mm -hmm. really is our ability to express ourselves uniquely in the world right? You know, yes. creative thinking, create, whether it's through your art, through your singing, it's being able to express who you are uniquely in the world. And so I thought, well, why is it that we're, we're, we're falling down on creativity? It's like, you know, you're a, a, a flower girl at a wedding going here, have some creativity. I don't need it anymore throughout, throughout our life. And, um, and I started thinking, well, you know, perhaps it's all about, you know, as we get older, we, we start to plug ourselves into um, more, we, to fit into society, we plug ourselves into organizations and we have, you know, we have uh, school and we have ballet lessons and we have church and we have, you know, Boy Scouts and we have all of these different things that we do. Um, and every, everything we end up doing has its own set of rules. You can do this. You can't do this. You can, this is what's yep. okay. This is what's not okay. And we're starting to assimilate all of this as we get older. And, you know, I, in the book, I call it your lines, right? Every character in your life has their lines. This is what you can mm -hmm. do. This is what you can't do. And it's not necessarily all bad. Sometimes it's, you're the pretty one. So you're the talented yep. one. There's all of these different lines that show up in our lives. And when we focus on the lines, we start playing within the lines, mm -hmm. right? We shrink yeah. ourselves back in to fit into what we think we should be, who we think we should, you know, should be in the world. And we don't allow ourselves to really express our unique self into the world. And what I've learned through, you know, the work I've been doing over the last decade is that when you shift your focus off of the lines, off of the messages, off of this is what I should do, this is what I should be, and shift it to purpose, shift it to impact, or what I call your super objective, was the impact I want to have outside myself. It cuts through those messages. It cuts through those lines and allows you to tap into that natural creative genius that you were born to be. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think we all still, you know, I believe a lot of people talk about the work that you and I do as transformation work, but I don't think of it that way. I think of it as excavation work because I think that creative genius, that's who we truly are. If we do the work to get out of our own way and get really clear on what is it that drives us? What is the impact I'm here to bring to the world and it, to yeah. this conversation? Right. Yeah. I've, I've often said to people, uh, I, I am an ex, I, I am an archaeologist. I'm in an archaeological yes. dig to yes. find the treasure, the jewel of who you are that might be buried under 50 tons of crap, exactly. but, you, but it's never gone away. You were born whole, complete and magnificent, and that's never right. gone away. Right. But, it, but it's easy to forget it because it got buried under a ton of crap. Right. The truth is it's always been there. And that's Absolutely. really what we're trying to do. And, and, that being said, I had this conversation with, with one of my students yesterday and we were talking about it and said, you know, the, the, and he was saying, you know, he'd recommended somebody to me and he goes, this person really needs you. And I know that like I've given you a great referral and, and they had a conversation with you and they're not going to do the work. And, and I said, why? And he goes, well, you know, they were, he said they were using excuses of money and time and blah, blah, blah. And he goes, but I know it's not true. I know they got plenty of money and I know they could make the time. So I said, why do you think it is? And he says, because the person thinks they're damaged and that that's what you'll tell them. And I said, but I was very clear in stating you're not damaged. And he said, I know. He says, but he can't believe that he's not. Right. So and somebody sees that magnificence in someone, it can often feel like a con because everybody else has been right. telling you, you're so you're broken. You right. are not broken. And, right. and, you know, as Kimberly has just said to you, that genius you know, it may only show up in 2% in the adults, but that's just what's showing up. Right. No, it's that's not right. that that's went exactly away. It. That's exactly it. It's just it. covered up. 
And if you're focused on what you can't do and what you can't be and you can't have, you will live into that focus. We are that absolutely. powerful. <laughs> we are, absolutely. Be yeah. Beautifully said. We're going to prove ourselves right. You have, um, you know, you, you, you had a, a very, you know, successful life in the drama world. You've transformed. You've gone into leadership. You're working, you know, extensively around the world. You're doing some powerful stuff, great books, TEDx presentations, etc. What was the turning point in your life, in your leadership, even in your business philosophy? Uh, well, gosh, so mm, I could I could tell you a different different launch point. There's right? always more than so, one. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, the turning point for me, from a professional place was I, you know, I, I went off to college, you know, I grew up on a ranch in Montana, Dove. So, you know, I was a, I was a country mouse and right. um, I would sing to the cows and, and I, you know, but I, I was this fearless kid and, and I went off to college and, you know, I'd been used to being the fearless kid and I uh, had auditioned for my first my first show in the theater department and I go into my audition and this kid that used to not be afraid of anything. I mean, I would sing at anything. I would, you know, it, nothing stopped me. All of a sudden I stood up on that stage and, and if you, I don't know if you've ever been in an audition situation, but you're usually on, on an empty stage. The, the house, the theater is, is empty and dark and mm -hmm. the director is sitting in the back of the theater taking notes and looking at you with you of course perceive to be lots of judgment right exactly and so yeah. you stand and I talk about vulnerability i mean you are you are in such a vulnerable place and so for the first time really in my life other than you know maybe some boy asking me out or something um the first time really in my life i felt that sense of total vulnerability. I, you know, my hands started to shake. I started to sweat. I felt a little bit like I wanted to vomit. I couldn't think if you would have asked me my name, I don't know that I could have told you. <laughs> like, it's like, I, I felt completely betrayed by my body, right? I'm like, yeah. who is this person? And um, so, you know, I make it through that first audition. And what's really interesting is that, I don't, you know, by the grace of God, because I don't know how I got through that audition, to be quite honest. But when I managed to get cast in spite of myself, and I would I would show up in rehearsal. I'd show up in performance, and I'd shift my per, my attention completely on stage to connect with that other person on the stage. All those sensations went away, right? Mm -hmm. And I was I was left up there. Uh, I was I was able to perform with ease and grace. I didn't even think about it. It was just uh, uh, the the fact that I gave a powerful performance wasn't registering on me because I wasn't focused on it. Right. Mm. And so you fast forward and I, you know, I had a very circuitous path that took me from the theater into the business world. But I started moving into the direction of training and development, you know, about 15, 20 years ago. And, um, when you were six. Yeah, 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 exactly. Um, <laughs> And it was fascinating because I'd watch all of these, you know, I, I was an actor and, you know, like you, like you said, we study people and I was mm -hmm. fascinated by these corporate people because I didn't know any corporate people at the time. Right. Mm -hmm. So I would study them and I would watch them, how they showed up in my classroom when they were trying to prove themselves and when they felt like they weren't okay. And when they felt like, you know, they were worried about making a mistake and they didn't want to speak up. And I would watch the same thing happen to them in the classroom as I would teaching, as they would start to make themselves smaller, they would stop speaking or they'd overcompensate. They would do all these things that we do when we feel vulnerable and like we're not okay, right? Mm -hmm. And I thought, wow, that's really interesting because, you know, in the theater, we've got tools to deal with that, you mm -hmm. know, because in the theater, we know it's a vulnerable place. That's not news, right? You, right. you, you get it, right? You're on right. stage all the time. But in the business world, you somehow feel like you have to hide it. Like, no, we don't right. deal with, well, we don't talk about being vulnerable. We don't talk about emotions. You know, we're just, that's just not okay. But what I was seeing in the corporate world is these heightened emotions in this ultra vulnerable place, right? And, yep. and I thought, wow, you know, I bet that, I bet that these tools that we use in the theater could make a difference to these people. And so, that's when, uh, that's when I started, I started my company called On Stage Leadership. And, and it wasn't 
I wasn't using, I didn't call it on stage leadership because, you know, we're going to use tools from the theater. Yes, we use tools from the theater, but that's not why I called it that. I called it that because as a leader, you're always on stage. Always. We're yeah. always on stage. People are always paying attention to what we're saying. They're always paying attention to what we're doing, what we're not doing, the things we're not saying, right? And, and every minute of every day, they're either deciding to cast us in their hearts and minds or they're not. Right? But it is, you are in a heightened situation that's very vulnerable, that the people that you need to lead and influence are either choosing you or they're not. It's and very true. if you are not able to make an impact in the face of that kind of vulnerability, you cannot be successful. And so that's, you know, that was, that's, I launched on stage leadership back in 2008. You know, and this is, Dub, I mean, you know this, you've been doing this work forever, right? This was before Brene Brown's oh, yeah. FedEx talk on vulnerability. This was sure. before Simon Sinek's book, you yeah. know, came out. And, and it, so when I started talking about this stuff way back then, people thought I was crazy. You know, oh, yeah. why are we talking about vulnerability in the workplace? And why are we talking about, you know, taking the mask down? Why would anybody want to do that? And I actually had a woman in my class saying, you know, I don't know why we need to take the mask down. You know, I go to work every day and I'm, we're masked and we do our jobs. And then, you know, we get on the corporate jet and we talk to, we take our masks down, we talk about our kids, right? And, you know, this is the same woman who was laid off, you know, because she couldn't sure. connect to her people, right? Because yeah. it's a different world than it was a decade ago. And, and exactly. And, you know, um, I, I had a client I was working with last week, um, executive, and I've worked with him off and on for 15 years. And he said, you know, he says, your biggest challenges have always been ahead of your time. He goes, you know, Brene Brown is very popular with vulnerability and stepping into greatness. And he goes, you've been talking about that for 20 odd years. Know, you know, like, oh. and, and authentic <laughs> leadership, you know, and he goes, you've been talking about authenticity. He goes, I came to your authenticity programs 15 years ago. Right. You know, and, and it's, you know, it's great. I mean, I'm glad it's becoming more, recognized and more open in the world but it's still very new for a lot of people right. and so right. you know you, you and i it, it's and this is part of the thing is it can become very easy for us to become dismissive it can be very easy for us to go yeah you know i've been talking about it for a long time and not think it's a big thing but i i'm constantly reminded and i say this all the time that courage is subjective yeah. <clears throat> and there's things i can do in my life that you go wow you're so brave that are not brave for me at all yeah that, yeah. They're just what I do. And there are things that you do that I think, wow, you're so brave and they're not brave for you. So it's really recognizing that courage is subjective and, and having the courage, stepping into the bravery of the next step, not the next thousand steps, but the next step right. is a really important piece. Right. right. Well, when and we, I think, oh, go ahead. Well, Tom. well it was, what I, I find really interesting is I don't believe that we, we experience bravery in ourselves. I think, I think bravery is something that lives outside of myself. I can look at you and go, wow, you are so brave. Right. But I, I don't look at myself and go, I'm, I'm brave. I never feel brave. I ne that's not, I never experienced that in myself. I think bravery lives in our actions and we, we can see it. Right. But if we're waiting for ourselves to feel brave before we do brave, we're going to be waiting a heck of a long time. See, so yeah, I think right? I think that's the point right there. You you just nailed it. Bravery is something outside of ourselves that we don't see in ourselves, and, and it's not it it's something we have to actually we can't think into it. Right. And I think that, that right. we actually have to we have to go to to something else that that evokes the bravery. Right. And it's so funny because people are like, you know, just give me the acronym. Tell me what I need to do to be brave. And I'm like, you know what? Here's the deal. Your bravery is going to unfold one situation at a time. And because every human being you're around is going to need something different from you. Yeah. If you want to make an impact, you're going to have to pay attention to what does that person need from you in this situation for you to have the impact you want to have. And, and it's going to be different for every person you meet. So it would be, it would be disingenuous for me to say, I've got the magic pill here, learn this acronym. That's going to teach you to be brave. You know, that there's no such thing really mm -hmm. as a formula for bravery. It's, you know, get clear on your, get clear on who you are, the impact you want to have, name it so you can do something about it. And you know what? 
half the time you're not going hit to hit your mark. Half the time you're going to have to be so present with other people that you can say, okay, did I achieve the impact I wanted to have here in this situation, in this conversation, in this meeting, on this call, in this podcast, whatever it happens to be? Yes or no. If I didn't, what action do I take to get closer? What action do I take to clean it up? Because as human beings, we are going to mess up. I mean, that is what's real. And so how do you own it and just just move on to the next step, right? Yeah. Very well said. We are, we're moving towards the very end of the show. And there's a couple of things I want to ask you. Um, first of all, you know, I think that one of the places it's most difficult to be courageous for most people is with family. Um, I find that um, very often I'm, I'm working with people and I'm saying, you know, just because they love you, doesn't mean they know best for you. Yeah. Um, very often, uh, as Ian Levanzant said, uh, the family is the anchor around around your ankles or neck, yeah. uh, and and sometimes they are the the wings that, that help you to fly. Yeah. How has family impacted you in moving towards your your dreams, your goals, and becoming the kind of brave leader that you wanted to be. Yeah. Well, I think my, my parents set a really great foundation for me in that they were pretty purposeful people. And I don't think that they could have said, this is my super objective, right? But my mom, she is an artist. She uh, was a, a, she's a painter. She, so she, everything she did was really about reflecting beauty. And you would see that in her work. You would see, we would be, we'd be driving to school and then we'd, I'd be sitting in the backseat of the car and she'd be like, oh, look, Kimberly, it's a watercolor sky, you know, and she just, she saw beauty in a way that most people never did. And then she reflected wow. it back in her work and she reflected it back in her words and everything about her was reflecting beauty. That's really who she is. That's, that's what drives her as a leader, right? Mm. And she'd, she'd laugh. She'd be like, I'm not a leader, but that is, that's who she of course, is. Right? Yeah, of course, impact, right? Right. And then my dad was very, my dad's a very interesting character because he's very type A, very, very driven. And he spent his whole life pushing the envelopes. He just pushes, pushes, pushes. He's, he's a change the world kind of guy. And he did it through everything he's done. And, it, and so they have really taught me that I can, I can look at the world, I can take it and I can see its beauty and I can try, I can work to make an impact because that's the foundation that they set. But when I, when I really look at the impact my family as a unit has had, um, my brother, my brother, who's two years younger than me, Todd, he really has probably made the biggest impact on me because he's taught me that maybe I don't know what's possible in the world. And, you know, when we talk about those lines, we talk about those limitations we set. He had, he showed me in such a visceral way when we were, um, when he, when I was a junior in college, he was a, uh, he was a junior in high school. I was a sophomore in college. So he was in a very serious car accident and um, he was in a coma and I had flown back from, I was going to school in Arizona and I'd flown, flown back to Montana to be with him. And so, you know, I, I would, my mom and I would sit, my dad had to go back because he was a, 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 a physician. So he had to go back and, and try to practice while his son was in a coma, if you can imagine how wow. horrific that would be. Um, but my mom and I would sit in his hotel, in his hospital room. And uh, I don't know if you've ever been in this kind of horrible situation where someone you love is, is, is fighting for their life, but they only allowed us a fifth, 10, 15 minutes an hour to be with mm -hmm. him and of course because he was in a coma they don't know what it is you hear what you understand any of no. those things we weren't allowed to say anything of consequence it was really like you know todd we're here we love you you know that's all we could say and so after doing this for five days I tell my mom, you know, I'm not going back to college because my flight was set to take off in two days. I'm not going back to college. You can't make me. And my mom said, no, you have to go back. If you don't go back, you're going to lose your scholarship. And, and I said, no, I'm not going to go back. I mean, if the only way I'm going to go back is if Todd wakes up and tells me to go back. And my mom looks at me and she says, you know, honey, that's, that's just not possible. And, um, and so the next day, uh, Todd actually did wake up out of his coma. But they didn't know if um, they, did, they didn't know if he, he would have any brain functioning at all. And so, while we were celebrating, the doctors weren't very optimistic. And mm -hmm. um, and that night, we got a call from the hospital, and, and we had spent the whole day at the hospital. That night, we we went back to the, the 
our hotel room, which was across the street. And we got that little flashing light on the, on the hotel room phone. And mm -hmm. we picked up the phone and we get a message that says, you know, Todd wants to see you. And we go racing across the street. And it's, you know, it's Montana in February. The, the street's icy. We're falling on, on the middle of the roads and we're laughing and we're crying. And we get to Todd's room and um, Todd, because his right hand was damaged really badly in the accident, it was all bandaged up. Um, and so the nurse had given him a pencil to write with his left hand. Mm. So he had written a note that says, where's mom? And so we walk into the hotel, hotel room, I mean, the hospital room, and my brother points to my mom and he points to the door. And my mom's like, what? And he points to my mom and he points to the door. And she's like, you want me to leave? And he shakes his head and he was very agitated. And she, she you know, starts to cry and she walks out of the, the hospital room and he beckons me over. And he, with his left hand, he writes a note and he says, uh, Kim, because he's the only one that gets to call me Kim anymore. Kim, <laughs> I, and then he drew a heart. I love you, but leave because I'll get better. Right. Um, so, wow. yeah, I, um, uh, the next, you know, I walk out of the hospital room and I'm like, fine, I'll go back, but only because Todd told me to, right? And I, I get back on, I get on the plane the next morning and, um, and I, uh, my, my brother went back into a coma for another month, but my parents never told me because they didn't want me coming back, right? Mm -hmm. um, but, and he's fine now, he's amazing. He's, he's an extraordinary <laughs> human being. But what he taught me, Dove, is that, you know, maybe we don't know what's possible. You know, we thought that was impossible. It's not going to happen. But maybe we don't know what's possible. And if we live into what's not possible, we'll create what's not possible. So maybe we have to find a way to expand our possibility by shifting our focus. And every, my brother is a testimony to what is possible in this world. You know, and, and now he is out there making an impact and he really, you know, cultivating care and heart. And, and he just is the most amazing human being. And uh, he is my testimony to remember, I don't know what's possible. I need to shift my focus and just worry, worry about impact because what's possible is going to unfold without me trying to force it, you know. What a great message. What a really great message. I mean, I, I, I think you're absolutely right. We, <clears throat> we all have these possibility lines in our head that are so restrictive and so untrue. Um, and yeah. a lot of it is based on social conditioning. It's based on media. It's based on family. It's based on education. It's based on all kinds of limiting shit. It's right. got nothing to do with reality. Exactly. Um, and every day people are doing the impossible. And I, and I like to remind people that you know, the difference between impossible, impossible and I'm possible is intent. Exactly. That's yes. That's yes. The and difference. if that's the thing that your readers can take out of this, it's like, it's anything is possible. Shift your focus with the impact you want to have, because that is going to change the way you show up in the world and your result to be a byproduct of that. Absolutely. Well, we're, we're, we're right through to the, to the end here. Um, I, I got to ask you a couple of quick things. Uh, number one, um, like to ask this and you know, I was going to, because of time, I was not going to put the question in, but because of the title of your book, I have to put it in. Yeah. Okay. And that is in a world where we're terrified to offend people, what's your bravest opinion? What's my bravest opinion? Uh, wow. Uh, my bravest opinion. <laughs> okay, my bravest opinion is trust yourself. I think that's a pretty brave thing to do. Trust, trust yourself. Trust your inner, your inner voice. And and because I'm not going to speak to politics or religion. <laughs> so, but but you know what? I think if. If you can get clear on who you truly are, you'll be able to determine what truth is, right? And mm -hmm. that will help you 
navigate the world and all the craziness that's going on, but getting, getting what, you know, who are you truly in your inner soul? What do you care about? And what, what's, what's congruent with that for real, for real? Yeah, yeah. So absolutely. Trusting yourself, not, not believing what other people tell you. Sure. And it, and as a final, just piece of guidance to our viewers, our listeners, what is the one thing you would suggest that they practically go do within the next, preferably 24 hours, but certainly the next few working days, what would you say to them? I would work on really getting clarity on the impact you want to have. What's the impact you want to have in your work, in your life? You know, why do you care? What's the impact you want to have? If you can get clarity on that, then if, if you can see it, you can do something about it. But you know what? If you, if you don't, if you don't know what you're aiming for, you're going to hit it every single time, right? So get clarity exactly. of what's the impact I want to have so you can hold your feet to the fire. Yeah, that's fabulous. Well, Kimberly, thank you. It's been a pleasure. It's been wonderful having you here. Thank you so much. Please tell our viewers, our listeners where they can find out more about you and all the wonderful resources that you offer. Oh, thanks, Dov. Well, so I am a big, big social media person because I believe the brave does not happen in a vacuum, that we need each other, <laughs> right? Yes. And so I'm big in, in Twitter. I'm on stage, Kimberly. Um, uh, you, you can find me on LinkedIn. You can find me on, uh, I've got a, a Facebook page. Um, look, look for a Kimberly Davis author. So I'm really big on social media because I think these conversations make us all better. And because brave unfolds one situation at a time we need to be active in the conversation all the time right with with podcasts like yours with with reading as many books as you can but really making an impact um, that way and then uh, i've got two websites uh, onstageleadership.com or braveleadershipbook.com and uh, reach out and connect because i i think your voice would make a difference in our conversation Fabulous. Well, thank you. It's been a pleasure and honor. I hope you'll stay with us to the end. Um, and again, I say to you, dear viewer, dear listener, remember, information is worth the hole in the donut. You got lots of information here. Now go put an application. The world is transformed through application, not information. So get out there and use it. You can chat about this show or any of our past episodes on our Facebook page, Dove Baron Leadership Podcast. And remember, the research consistently shows that one of the biggest challenges facing even the most successful companies can be somewhat counterintuitive in that these fast-growing companies often hit a point where they realize they're spending a fortune attracting, training, and developing their talent only to have them leave at a an alarming rate. If you're sick of investing in training and developing your talent only to have them leave before you get your ROI, then come talk to us at fullmontyleadership.com where we provide you with the essential leadership skills to rekindle and amplify the hidden loyalty assets inside of your organization by tapping into purpose. fullmontyleadership.com providing you with the concrete soft skills to get you and your organization to the top and keep you there. Why? because you can't outsource authenticity. Also remember to stop by the matrix, matrix.fullmontyleadership.com. You don't need a triple W, just matrix like the movie, .com and get your authentic leadership matrix self-assessment tool. It's valued at $197, absolutely free to you for being a regular listener viewer on our show. Remember you can play us on Google Play or on Alexa by simply saying, play Dove Baron Podcast. Thank you for sharing this show with everybody you know. Till next time. Stay curious, my friend. Stay curious about how you can be a little more brave in any single moment by being a little more authentic, by becoming focused on the impact that you can have. The bravery, as Kimberly has told you, is in being focused on the impact, not on your own stuff. I'm Dalv Barron, and I'm here to assist you tapping into your deep greatness to reach the next level of clarity, focus, purpose, and profit in your business, your life, and your leadership impact. And I am out.